going on, everyone? Welcome back to Courtside Financial uh, Podcast, the Courtside Financial Podcast, the podcast where we don't just talk about delivery numbers. We talk about the chess moves, the market psychology, and the things that are actually making shifts in the market that we uh, love to watch, the Chinese EV market and the global EV market. Today is Thursday, August 21st, and let me tell you that the EV space is serving up some pretty fascinating storyline. We've got NEO dropping a bomb with their third generation ES8 that's got Tesla looking sideways. Europe having an identity crisis on which uh, they're deliberating on if they actually want to ban gas cars and a million dollar Chinese EV sedan that's actually outselling Mercedes Maybach. But here's what makes things interesting. These aren't isolated events. They're all connected in tapestry that's telling us exactly where the market is headed. Let's start with the story that had me doing absolute double takes. Neo just unveiled their third generation ES8 and folks, the pricing strategy much like the Envo L90 launch is nothing short of marketing genius. Here are the numbers that matter. The third generation ES8 with the 100 kilowatt hour battery pack starts at around 417,000 Ren. That's about $58,000 US dollars for the comparison. But here's the kicker, that represents a 25% price drop from the previous gen. Under their battery as a service model, you're looking at 308, uh, 1,800 Ren, which undercuts the model Y long range by 30,000 Ren. Now, as someone who's bullish on NEO, I could easily just celebrate this as a win, but let's think a little bit more strategically. What's actually going on here? They're not just competing on price, they're redefining their position. We're talking about a vehicle that's grown from a mid to large SUV to a full size luxury SUV. The dimensions tell a story as well. 5,280 millimeters long, 2,010 millimeters wide with a 3,250 millimeter wheelbase. That's bigger than a BMW X7. But here's where it gets interesting from a technology standpoint. This thing is built on a 900 volt architecture with a 925 volt maximum voltage supporting 4C charging on the 100 kilowatt hour pack and 5C on the upcoming 120 kilowatt hour option. For context, 5C means theoretically charging from zero to 100% in 12 minutes. We're talking about 250 kilometers of range in a five minute charge. So the strategic play here is fascinating. Neo's betting that the premium EV market is ready for mass adoption, but only if the value proposition is undeniable. They're not racing to the bottom, they're bringing luxury technology to a broader uh, price point. Now, while Neo is making bold moves in China, let's talk about what's going on across the pond because it's revealing something crucial about market timing and political will. The EU set this ambitious target ban all internal combustion engines by 2035. Sounds progressive, right? But here's what's actually happening on the ground. The numbers paint a different picture. In the first half of 2025, pure EVs represented just 15.6% of all vehicle sales. Hybrids, 34.8%. And traditional cars coming in at 37.8% of the market. But here's the really telling part. Even Mercedes-Benz CEO Ola Kalanius, whose company you'd expect to be leading the EV charge, is now saying that banning ICE vehicles would lead to the collapse of the European auto industry. Think about that for a moment. The CEO of Mercedes-Benz, Mercedes-Benz is essentially saying we're not ready. And the data backs him up. Mercedes EV sales declined year over year, uh, representing only 8.4% of EV sales in the first half of uh, 2025, global EV sales. Even including plug-in hybrids, they're only at 20.1%. Here's what this tells us about market psychology. Europe is um, starting to understand that mandating change does not fill the gaps in infrastructure, consumer demand, or industrial capability to support that change. They have just under 900,000 charging stations when they need 3.5 million by 2030. That's not a gap, that's chassism. The EU has already started walking back their timelines, postponing emission fines until 2027, and also creating exemptions for synthetic fuel. This isn't policy evolution, it's a retreat in the face of an economic reality. Now here's a story that caught my eye because it represents something that we haven't seen before in the luxury EV space. Zunji, that's the joint venture between Huawei and Jack. They launched their S800 luxury sedan on May 30th, price between 
between 708,000 and 1 million rent. That's roughly 98,000 to 142,000 dollars. In just 67 days, they racked up over 10,000 pre-orders. So let me put that in perspective. In the first half of 2025, the Mercedes S-Class, the, the king of luxury sedan, sold 5,951 units in China. Zunji is on track to potentially match or exceed that with their very first model. But what's fascinating here is the customer profile. These aren't traditional luxury car buyers. A significant portion are post-90s customers, millennials and Gen Zs, they're buying million yuan cars. One customer literally drove a Xiaomi SU7 to pick up their Zunji. The success story here isn't just about product, though the product is impressive. It's about brand ecosystem. These customers aren't just buying a car, they're buying into the Huawei lifestyle. Many already own Huawei's trifold smartphones that cost over 20, thousand rent. So clearly the customers trust Huawei's technology story. What Huawei has done is create what I call tech luxury. They've taken their credibility in 5G, AI, and consumer electronics and translated that into automotive prestige. These customers trust that when Huawei says I've got L3 autonomous driving and advanced um, safety systems that they've actually got it. So what do all these stories tell us when we weave them together? First, the Chinese EV market is entering a new phase of maturation. Neo's aggressive pricing isn't desperation, it's confidence. They believe that they can scale their premium technology to mass market volume while maintaining margins through their service ecosystem and battery as a service model. Second, Europe's stumbling reveals the complexity of energy transition. It's not enough to mandate change. You need consumer acceptance, infrastructure readiness, and industrial capabilities aligned. China succeeded with EV because they've built the entire stack simultaneously. Manufacturing, supply chain, charging network, and of course consumer incentives. Third, brand power in the EV space is being redefined. Traditional automotive prestige was built over decades of engine refinement and racing heritage, but that is now being challenged by technology credibility. Huawei proved that with the right execution, a tech company can enter the ultra luxury sphere of automotive. For investors, I think that this creates some interesting dynamics. The winners in the next phase won't necessarily be the companies with the oldest uh, automotive heritage. They'll be the ones who can best integrate technology, manage supply chain, and create compelling value propositions across different price points. As we watch these trends unfold, here are the questions that I'm tracking. Can NEO maintain premium brand positioning while scaling to mass market pricing? History shows us that this is incredibly difficult. Ask Infinity how things went when they tried to move down market from Lexus. Will Europe's policy retreat create an opening for Chinese EVs to gain market share during this um, transition amongst all the confusion. Chinese manufacturers are already building European plant. Helium Poland, NEO's partnerships for European expansion, and perhaps most intriguingly, can Zunji's success be replicated? Or is this a moment where Huawei's specific brand cachet creates an unrepeatable advantage? Anyways, that was it for this episode of the Courtside Financial Podcast. I hope you found it useful, entertaining, maybe informative if it was any of those things make sure that you click the notification bell icon share the video leave a comment down below hit the like button uh, make sure you subscribe to the channel all your engagement really does help us to get this content out to a broader audience so more people can be aware so thank you guys for watching i'll catch you in the next episode of the courtside financial podcast this is obi signing off see you next time bye